Uh, and we, sh we should be live, so this is good. And test of the clicker. See, it's a good thing I tested that clicker. Nandeska. Mm. Oh, you can't. But I'm right here, and it's not going, so that's okay. I know how to. This could be the reason. Huh? All right. So, um, and you're seeing all right? Beautiful. So, uh, welcome aboard. A uh, couple, couple more folks coming, going in and out of not yet convinced they want to be in this session or not. In out, in. Either in or out. You can't, can't be halfway. You stand in the doorway, but only during an earthquake. So, uh, and most of, I know West Coasters, nobody, okay, one person uh, got that. So a million years ago, I was in a conference room and there was an earthquake in California. You could tell all the Midwesterners, because we were just sitting there and going, wow, look at the lights, they're swinging. <laughs> Isn't that cool? But all the Californians were either underneath the table or in the doorway, which uh, was kind of kind of cool. Learn that lesson, you know, learn lessons like that only once much like uh, security and compliance conversations. So um, th this, I'm going to kind of put the angle on this of how to have the security compliance conversation with your customers. And then I'll show you a couple of demos in Office 365 that you can use. And then uh, we'll hit on some other, uh, other things here. So again, uh, should be a good, good session. I, I don't know how many of you are actively selling Office 365 today by show of hands. And then those of you who aren't have your hands down. So see, ones and zeros. Uh, and then how many of you who are actively selling, so you could have kept your hands up, but I don't want to wear you out. Uh, actively selling Office 365, do customers ask security compliance questions around? Well, it should have been, it should have been everybody. because the, uh, So there are a couple of big hurdles with Office 365, one of them being security. Um, you know. Uh, and, and these questions come up less today than they used to in the old days. And in the old days, just as by way of introduction, uh, my name is Tom Moen, and I'm an Office 365 uh, technology specialist. And uh, I've been doing Office 365 in cloud since 2005. Uh, and I know somebody in here in their mind is going, well, be positive and ship till November 2007, so he's lying. Uh, before Business Productivity Online Suite, um, we had Microsoft Managed Services, MMS. And our first two customers were Coca-Cola Enterprises out of Atlanta, Georgia, uh, Ceridian in the Twin Cities, and then, uh, and I don't know that I'm supposed to be uh, using these names, uh, Energizer in St. Louis. And I worked with all three of those folks and then onboarded uh, the first 52 BPOS customers. So in between MMS and Business Productivity Online Suite, uh, we had uh, product called Exchange Hosted Services, and we acquired that front bridge uh, company. Uh, so the exchange hosted services were filtering. This is just a drill to see if my old brain can remember this or not. Filtering, archive, continuity, and encryption. And that used to spell face. That's how I remember that even after all these years. Space, you know? so, all right. Um, this is good. Uh, so that uh, was about 2006. And then again, Business Productivity Online Suite hit in about 2007. Uh, so uh, I also wanted to just uh, point out some of the other sessions that I'll be doing today. Uh, if you like this, you can uh, come and see me again uh, later during the day uh, or tomorrow. I'm filling in for somebody who, who uh, was going to do the encryption in Office 365. I've had a uh, history here, so somebody actually had to fill in for me. If you were in the Las Vegas session, that wasn't me presenting there because I was in an accident and had a broken collarbone and uh, two cracked ribs. I think I'm pointing on this side, but I believe they were on this side. Um, so uh, hit a wall and another, uh, it's, it's a long story, uh, but uh, I almost missed this one. So I like to race cars. And uh, I was coming around a corner at 154 miles an hour when another car uh, didn't understand the word apex and hugged the wall, hit the wall, and a car hit him. Uh, one was airlifted out, still in critical condition, but OK. And then the other one uh, was ambulanced away. But when you're going that fast and you see something like that happen and all you're thinking is, I don't want those parts to hit me. Uh, OK, none of you laughed at that. So you haven't had this experience yourself. Um, so uh, I, I, yeah, I'm glad I'm here. 
and uh, not in the hospital. And uh, so uh, I just wanted, uh, I don't know, I'll bring up some racing metaphors and things throughout the day. So uh, if I do that, you'll kind of have the background uh, and know that I try not to get uh, hurt very frequently. Uh, I don't know what that is, but that's okay. So any of these other sessions are good. And then this is kind of what we're going to talk about today, privacy protection, service level security. And then um, who says so besides the guy standing in the front of the room? Um, this deck is made available for you, so it's a deck that you can use when you're having a security uh, compliance conversation with your customers. Um, for those of you who didn't raise your hands on selling Office 365 today, this kind of really is the future. And in my other session, I'm going to be talking about you know Satya Nadella, our new CEO here at uh, Microsoft. Um, you know, change the mantra from we're no longer a Windows company to cloud first mobile first, right? So if you, if you haven't heard that, this is what we all hear at Microsoft on a daily basis is cloud first, mobile first, and then a new wrench in that is CRM. We are all CRM sellers. So normally I'd have you repeat after me, we are all CRM sellers. CRM is a huge thing for Microsoft and we see a 100% uh, attachment and 100% pull rate for customers who have moved their CRM to the cloud. They tend to move everything else to the cloud and they tend to consume Office 365. Another big thing for Microsoft is consumption. Uh, we've actually sold 85%. I work in the EPG, the enterprise uh, group, uh, the enterprise customer space. 85% of our enterprises across the United States, is anybody other, other than Robert uh, from outside the U.S., all right, so, so these numbers don't apply to whatever country you're in. But here in the United States, 85% of all of our customers are licensed in enterprise for Office 365. About 28, 29%, I don't think I'm supposed to share that number with you either, are deployed. And so we've got a big push on consumption, getting those enterprise companies who have bought Office 365 to deploy Office 365. Cool? And one easy way to do that is get people to use Office 360 or uh, CRM. Um, these are all the things that uh, you know I've told, and, the, and this is a slide from 2007 for crying out loud. Um, so I used these uh, pictures long before there were copyright infringement laws. Uh, that's, that's, so uh, I've always said that these are the, the huge benefits of Office 365. You get to pay for access. So you know why buy the Mona Lisa when for 14 euros you can stand in line and be insulted by some French people uh, and visit her, right? So wear a Canadian T-shirt. That's my little tip from your Uncle Tom there. Um, so you know don't pay for the Mona Lisa, just just go visit her. Um, paying for shared resources and especially when these shared resources, I don't know if you've heard statistics like three out of every five hard drives made today are being purchased by Microsoft. So we have some buying power there. Uh, we pay about two cents on the dollar for storage. So if you went out to buy NetApp or EMC storage, you'd pay a buck for that storage. Even with your great partner discount, potentially, we'd pay two cents. So um, the shared resources will cost less. This pay for speed and agility, I can only tell you that one of my very early business productivity online suite customers called me up and he said, Tom, we're doing a spin-off of these 650 employees. And um, on Monday at noon, they need to be off of our infrastructure. They need to be 100% severed. And I said, Joe, because that was his name, so the IT guy, uh, not the plumber, Joe, uh, what, what, what do you mean? And he <laughs> said, well, they need uh, email, they need collaboration, they need real-time collaboration, they need all these capabilities, they need it by Monday at noon. And I'm like, dude, it is Thursday at 5.42 p.m. You're telling me that in four days, they, these 650 people. So if we tried to you know, get servers, install OSs, harden them, install the apps, get that all set up, we wouldn't have a nice cube's chance of getting that done, right? Easily would have taken six months just to procure the hardware. Uh, and we didn't make the noon. We, we made the 12.31 p.m. on Monday time frame. But uh, that kind of agility and things, you just, you just couldn't see that in the real world of setting up hardware. And the other benefit here is paying for only what you need. You know, they spun this org off. They didn't know a year from now if they were going to be 6,500 employees, in which case they'd just write a check for $65,000 a month more to Microsoft, or if they were going to be 65 employees 
employees, which in, in which case they'd write a check for $6,000 less to Microsoft, right? So it's kind of a cool thing that they didn't have to get ca capacity planning perfect, which capacity planning is, yeah, you know, how many of you have nailed capacity planning with a customer? Yeah, yeah, me too. You know, and, and then you know, it, it's one of those things like flying in an airplane that the only good wind is a perfect dead-on tailwind. Even if it's a quartering tailwind, you still have to adjust and you're, you're losing um, time and efficiency. So too much capacity, you've wasted money. Too little capacity, you know, your help desk and you're getting phone calls. Cool? All right. And then uh, lastly, you're paying for a complete solution that's all integrated. Uh, and works well together. And again, I'm just trying to get some extra mileage out of these slides I've been using since 2007. I don't know if any of you have seen these demonstrations. I'd be more than happy to entertain them. I think a demo is uh, worth a million uh, words, and this is definitely a great way to show your customers the value of Office 365, so I'd be more than happy to you know, spend the vast majority of our time walking you through some demos. I don't know how many of you have seen these. How, how many of you do like a DLP demo, data loss prevention demo in Office 365 today? Good, just about everybody. That was for our viewing audience. <laughs> everybody raised their hands. It was awesome. They're fantastic. Uh, so, uh, and MRM holds, legal holds. I'll show you a couple things on holds. So, uh, are you guys interested in seeing these demos or not so much? You just want me to blabber or? Good, all right, cool beans. All right, then we'll do that. Here's my other little tips and tricks. So um, these are things, have any of you been on a data center tour? Holy crud, man. Um, so we should have had a shuttle and we should have taken you out to Quincy or somewhere. Um, next conference, I'll guarantee, well, you do these here, right, every fall? Well, we can't just show up. There's background checks. There's all kinds of stuff that have to happen where you get shot. Um, just like being in a gangsta movie. Um, so uh, when I have customers going to the data center tour, I give them these little tips and tricks what to ask for. Look at the monitoring. Um, so like in the Chicago data center, upstairs is where we have the people who have logical access to the data center, but it's only uh, at, you know, a given amount of time. But I, in that Chicago data center, it's kind of cool too because I show them like the seismic monitoring and braking. You do how many earthquakes there have been in Chicago in the last million years? Like three. Uh, and one of them was a 3.2. It was like the alarm clock went off next to me. That buzzing was almost the exact same effect as a 3. Point. All right, you guys are this is really not coming along for the humor. Um, backup power, we had backup power days. Anyway, this is, this is my little 10 things that everybody should ask when they go on a data center tour. Uh, and, and it's kind of just a thing that I made up and, um, you know, there are things like in the Chicago data center. The first time I was there, Roger Good had built that data center and he's a super awesome dude. Uh, there are these box beams and they are this big, I'm not kidding you, that's like what, a foot by a foot of box beam iron. And it went up to the ceiling and they were about every couple of meters apart, which is insane. And I was saying to Roger, I was like, are we going to expand up and put another floor in here? Because these big shipper containers that have thousands of servers in them, and there are like hundreds of these shipper containers, right, that you've seen on a boat or fall off of a boat into the ocean. There are hundreds of these things with thousands of servers each. And then it's kind of cool to see the different manufacturers. So some open from the side, giving you access to the servers. Some you open a door and walk down the middle and get access to the, to, to the gear. Some have cooling units right on top. So they, those are the ones that we're just putting out in fields, like in West Des Moines. They just sit out. There's not even a building around them because the storage container is explosion proof and all that kind of cool stuff. But I said, Roger, are we expanding? Is that why we put these big box beams here? And he's like, Tom, you know, what's right outside our door? And I'm like, uh, I don't know, grass, parking lot? Uh, and he's like, oh, it's hair. So if a 747 falls out of the sky, we want it to bounce off the roof. So that's kind of cool. So six feet of concrete up there, which is pretty awesome. Um, so there's a lot of things uh, here, and I will, will talk to you about that. A great resource, um, Trust Office 365 is our trust center. That is uh, awesome. It's a great resource. I have customers all the time asking me for what do you do about background checks? Can we, have, can we see your operational procedure guide, the yellow book? No, we're not going to give you a copy of our yellow book. It's just it's never going to happen. But if you're there at a data center tour and you say, hey, can I see the yellow book? 
they'll point to a three ring binder and hand it to you and you can page through it and go, mm, now I'm satisfied. That's what you should do when you're handed a yellow book. Is, mm, yeah, I'm satisfied. So, and then there's 10 things to ask every cloud provider. And this is on the Trust Center. It's kind of hidden on the front page. Uh, but this is a great thing to give your uh, customer because all of the blue hyperlinks are actual links to documents that answer that question fully, completely, and robustly. So you don't have to carry all this stuff around in your wetware. You can hand it to them, right, or point them to that page and then they can, wetware's their brain. Just in case. And so there we go. Cool? Yes? Um, yeah, I believe so, right? Everybody here is going to have access to this slide deck. There will be a couple of slides missing. Mm -hmm. There will be a couple of slides missing, a couple of slides that I can't share with you, uh, but you are seeing them because of your gracing me with your presence today. So um, from here, uh, these are the things I'm going to talk about, security, compliance, and privacy. And I'm going to pick up the pace a little bit here because we've, we've only got um, about uh, 40 minutes left. But the big thing that we get to tell people, and I always do side-by-side -side comparisons of what Microsoft says our privacy is in Office 365 compared to that other um, multicolored logo company that starts with a goo and ends with a goo. Uh, yeah, something. Um, and so, so these are all good things, and they're wonderful things to talk about with customers. And uh, there, there are service level capabilities and there are customer controls that customers can put in place. Uh, and and um, again, you, some of these slides will be in here. Um, what's very cool is how we do and how we manage and maintain and work against threats. And we do this in these three ways. So there's an outsider, somebody's on the outside trying to break in. There's an insider, somebody slips through the cracks of our background checks and urine and blood analysis and gets inside and tries to steal some data. And then there's an end user that may work for your, your customer's company, right? So somebody who you know steals the CEO's password. We can't defend against that. I worked for a company, we deployed them in Office 365, and their uh, VP of infrastructure was fired. And he always wore these three USB sticks around his neck. And I, just, I was like, I've never seen anybody with a lanyard with three USB sticks. And I was always kind of curious, like, is there a, you know, a um, Windows to go on one of those USB sticks? And you just might need to plug in and create a new environment. I was always curious. And he was fired. And then when he was unfired, I learned what was on those USB sticks. And it was executive level emails that he had gone in and sequestered that he said, if you don't hire me back, these are going to the Wall Street Journal. Job security, huh? Not very honest. There's no integrity in that. But now I'll see all of you guys next year with three USB sticks around your neck. So, um, so these are the things that we put in in place. Um, we're always working to prevent breach. We do have some very great intrusion detection. Uh, it, all of our services are secure by design. Ever since you know the code red thing, the little high school dude living in my backyard, Edina, Minnesota, had all that spare time on his health uh, on his hands, and he wrote the code red virus. We've had the secure data lifecycle here at Microsoft. How many of you have heard of secure data lifecycle? So all of our code, all of our applications, everything is built to be secure. Whether you're running it in your data center uh, or your customer's data center, or we're running it in ours. So that's kind of cool, right from there. The other thing that we do is we're, we're not idiots. <clears throat> so, um, and, uh, and I think when I choked there, I meant some of us are not idiots based on the email thread thing. That's what we, we're, we're, there's a mail storm right now where somebody replied uh, to a distribution list that has 30,000 recipients on it. And now other people are saying, take me off of this thread. Yeah, me too, plus one, plus two, plus many. <sighs> it tries your patience, it does. Um, I have a folder in my email that you may or may not see that says idiots, and then I put stuff in there. And today I'm going to put about five emails in there. Um, but uh, we 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 assume breach. We assume that we're going to be breached. This hasn't happened since 1989. We have never uh, had a breach. We've never had a data loss. Sans, there was a Hotmail incident, and the first thing you have to tell your customers. And the first thing I usually tell customers when there's a whiteboard in the room is I draw where, and you guys wouldn't be able to do this, but I draw like Hotmail and I put it in Napa, California and Winnipeg, Canada. 
And I say these are our consumer services running in our consumer data centers. Office 365 runs in Virginia, Quincy, Washington, Chicago, West Des Moines, San, Jose, uh, San, San, Jose, San, Jose, San Antonio, Texas. These are our commercial services. They have an SLA. There's guaranteed 99.9% .9 uptime. There's an SLA around um, data loss and those things. There's a data privacy agreement. There's an online services terms and conditions. None of that stuff exists in the free hotmail. Cool? So we separate those things. That other company that I mentioned a few seconds ago, all their stuff runs in all their data centers. So you've got a free Gmail account sitting right next to a uh, highly paid for Google Apps for business account, right? We separate that stuff, which is cool. And we assume there's going to be a breach. And we do some things that actually um, help us defend your data and your customer's data. So at the, at the data level, and again, you'll have these slides, so I'm going to peruse through this really quickly so we can get on to the fun, fun part and the, and the demos and the exciting stuff. And uh, I, I know I closed Facebook, but uh, sorry for that pop-up there. I mentioned the seismic bracing. There's 24 by 7 on-site security staff, and these aren't Paul Blart mall cop people. These are trained uh, folks. They do wear sidearms. Um, they won't really shoot to kill you unless you're doing something uh, really bad, but they do have that uh, force and that authority. Um, so, and there's not just a uh, dude or dudette there. There are usually three people in that front office. So you go on a data center tour, you park. The first thing I say is notice the perimeter security. There's a fence. It kind of looks like a privacy fence that you'd put around a swimming pool. But if you look close, there's like this two-inch cable. So Roger Good had, I said, man, if I wanted to take you out, I'd just go steal an armored car, which in and of itself is kind of difficult, and I'd crash through that fence at 100 miles an hour and take you out. And he goes, look again. And uh, he had a bit of an Aussie accent like Robert. He's like, look again. <laughs> I'm not doing it right. <laughs> I don't know what accent that was. Uh, he said, uh, you might be hitting that fence at 100 Thomas, but you're going to come out in three slices. That might be more Kiwi than Aussie. I'm sorry. Thanks. See? It's almost like I threw my voice there. Yeah. So he said, uh, you're coming out on three, three, three slices on this side uh, and, uh, and with a kangaroo. So um, I said, yeah, probably. Uh, so uh, it's kind of cool to look at that stuff. And then days of backup power, that's actually weeks now. So you'll see these big cat generators with big diesel tanks. And we've got three suppliers of diesel fuel on multiple power supply companies and everything. And again, these things have tens of thousands of servers in them. Uh, blah, blah, blah. The network is secure, too. Um, so the network's coming in. Microsoft between data center and data center. How many of you have heard, like, you know, we have this smoking hall. So if, uh, you know, and I owe this scenario to Tom Clancy. I didn't make this up on my own. Somebody ships a nuclear bomb into Washington, D.C. in a Coke machine. Um, if you've seen the movie, Some of All Fears, that nuke goes off and blows up, and it takes out the Virginia data center with a zero RPO, zero RTO, zero RPO, zero RTO, near instantaneous failover, we would fail over for that customer to Quincy, Washington, for example. Zero RPO, zero RTO, near instantaneous. Oh, yeah. You guys aren't excited by that either. It's pretty exciting stuff because most people have like a three-day, oh, we have a three-day RPO and two-week RTO, recovery time objective and recovery point objective. Uh, but since you're not excited by that, uh, and then Mount Rainier blows up. So while we fail you over to Tuck Tuckwilla, Washington, or Quincy, Washington, we start backing you up to San Antonio, for example, right? Mount Rainier blows up. Wipes out Chicago, zero. God bless you. Thanks for playing along. Uh, we fail over to San Antonio. A hurricane moves inland and wipes out San Antonio. We fail over, and there's a... Zero RPO, zero RTO, near instantaneous failover. But by that time, I'm heading to the bomb shelter with my couple cases of Jack Daniels and not caring about the email. Uh, so that's where I'm going to be. <laughs> the cool thing is, is that network, that Office 365 network that goes between our data centers is all Microsoft-owned fiber. We own that. It's not public fiber. It's not out there like, again, somebody else's fiber. So that's very cool. Um, host applications, patching, malware, protection, all of our servers run BitLocker, 256-bit AEF. We do have the secure uh, data lifecycle that I mentioned a second ago. I don't know why I can't go back. 
No, I can't go back or forward. Beautiful thing. Hmm. All right. My, <laughs> the audience is never supposed to be more humorous than the presenter. It's a lesson for you right there. All right, so as long as, uh, since I exited my slides so perfectly well there on purpose, uh, I am over here in uh, the admin center, so in, uh, I'm, in, I'm in Outlook. And how many of you know, like, when you log in, it goes to default to, and you can change that, yes or no? Huh? Yes, way to go. I love you guys. I'm loving you more and more every minute. This is awesome. So um, I'm over here. I'm getting ready to send an email. I'm sending an email to my Hotmail account, Timon2000, and the only reason I do that is to prove to everybody that my Hotmail account isn't beaver number one fan at hotmail.com. So if you were confused as to that fact, confuse no more. I'm attaching a file because this person in account's payable, and Tom Moen wanted to see a file of this customer data. So again, the first thing you noticed is there were a couple of mail tips up here. Chris Kunze, and this is real life. I've often told him he never gets back to anybody uh, with any less than two days. So I said, you should just say I'm a really busy guy. Allow two days, and you can set your own mail tips, yes or no. Yeah, uh-huh, beautiful thing. So uh, it's telling me that this person's outside of our company. I can remove that recipient, and then down here, uh, the thing that you probably noticed that is kind of uh, unique was after I had attached this email, I got a little red exclamation point, right? So it's telling me there's something wrong with this file that I'm trying to attach, and I didn't know that as an end user, and then it's giving me this policy tip, and up here it's telling me that, hey, if you're trying to send confidential information, this, this has credit card numbers in it. What the heck are you doing, right? So it first, and what's happening here in the background, if I just went click send, I would get an undeliverable response because that message is going to be blocked. It won't be sent. We put a data loss prevention policy in place that says do not allow credit card information to go outside this company. Now, one of the customers I was working with, even though this, is this one algorithm that we use for credit card information is very good, very robust, and works all the time, they had part numbers that were 4-4-4-4. What else is 4-4-4-4, right? So we changed it so it said, except if the words part or part number or number or it's from these groups of folks who would have part numbers in their email, then let that go through. Cool? All right. So the other thing I'm going to do here is remove this recipient. Boom, now look at the red exclamation point went away. Why? Because Chris Kunze's in accounts payable, accounts receivable. He, in this case, not she, could be Chris, Harry, Kim, Pat. These are all, these are all. I was working with a lady out here and her name was Pat and I was IMing her for years and years and years and I was thinking of Patrick and then discovered when we put photos in link, uh, but that thing was called office communications. Uh, I was like, oh man, it's Patricia, not Pat. And then I started going back through all the conversations I had for years and years and years ago. How many of those things were really not acceptable to a female? Hmm. So those of you who have had this similar experience. Um, so now I can send this email and it will go to Chris. So this is kind of cool. And <coughs> you've seen the whole thing, this whole process of detect, detected that it had credit cards. Right? I acted, I said block it, or if this is going to Chris, I also put RMS, I write protected this, so this email will be sent to Chris Kunze with do not forward rights protection. So I detected something bad was gonna leak out the company. I acted on it by educating somebody and then protecting the content. And then I can now classify that and like I could put it on hold or I could report this to a compliance officer in our company. Cool? So this is how hard this was to set up, and it wasn't very difficult at all. There we go. We're in exchange under compliance. And it is very cool that the admin center is coming to those M SKUs to a small and medium business. And, and don't let yourself get distracted here when I go to the data loss and hold by the dirty words. Uh, there's a company that actually had to allow dirty words from certain resenders because in their industry they have some dirty words that aren't dirty words, but they're still dirty words. 
but it's, it's a mind-boggling thing. I'm not going to open that. No, these are dirty words. They're flat out dirty, <laughs> dirty words. Um, so uh, here again, if it's credit card information going to an external recipient, I'm just going to block that flat out, right, and send a bounce message. Hey, we didn't send your email, idiot. You can leave off the idiot part. Uh, and then if it's an internal recipient, we're going to do the same. First thing we're going to do is say, hey, we're going to block this email. So um, if, the, if, the, if the recipient is located inside the company and you have all the message properties, everything that you can use here, any recipient is this particular, the particular recipient is inside, outside, this person, this domain, this email address, you, you have a, just a ton of flexibility here. And you can add conditions until your little heart content, so the subject or body. Here at Microsoft, if the subject or body has the words confidential or uh, protect in it uh, or encrypt, we will protect and encrypt that message. And we've got about 34 templates of uh, RMS, uh, rights management services. In the field, there are about 20 that we can use, but uh, out here at corporate, there, there are more for some reason. Um, but I'm saying, hey, uh, if this contains sensitive information, and then I did add an, a, and an accept if, and then I went back and said, so I should a condition that says, you know, do not pull forward this. So you can pick an RMS template. So here at Microsoft, you know, in the field, all 21 of my templates would show up out here at corporate, all 54 RMS templates. We've got a uh, developer kit, that, sure. Sure do. Yep, absolutely. So um, we'd, we'd work with a PDF as well. And then um, I don't know how much you know about our new RMS, but it's any file, any device. So now we can send a rights protected thing to an iPad or an Android and boom, still read that with RMS Sherry, which is in the App Store. You can download that today on an Android and iOS device. Sure. Um, so yeah, you would be, you're, an admin would set this up, right? So it's not going to be an end user. Uh, so the question was, uh, so first the question in the back was, um, will this work with PDFs? And, and then I explained that it works with not only PDFs, but it will work with any device. And then the other question that came in was uh, setting this up. And we've made it pretty easy to set up by putting some default uh, capabilities in here. And you will see that these uh, little, and I'll go back backwards just a couple of steps here. So hopefully you, you saw that. Um, but we did put these templates. So I do have a new DLP policy from a template. And then you will see a ton of templates. So for Robert, there are a couple for Australia. Um, and those of you who are standing in the, the Louvre line with your Canadian shirt, you saw the Canadian ones. And then the US and the UK are down here at the bottom. Um, so those are the templates that we give you for free out of the box. Uh, and they are in here. And then uh, if you want, you can import a DLP policy. So working with a large healthcare company, they said, hey, the HIPAA policy that you have built in isn't good enough for us. So Silver Fox out of Columbus, Ohio, built a really cool HIPAA policy, and they sent that to them, and they just imported it here, and away they went. And then the other thing, there is a DLP policy. So you guys, this is part of my strategic consulting. You all could be building RMS templates for your customers. You all could be building DLP policies for your customers. Right now, there's only about five or six people in the US that are building these DLP templates. Great opportunity. Sure. Mm -hmm. No. Rename it to .zip. Um, well, it, it does that now, so there's some in space. So the question was, is there any way to turn off the attachment of an EXE? And, and there really isn't. Um, you know, that's a, a copy now an EOP exchange online protection rule. Um, you know, you could go and build a connector to allow that, but you're almost only opening yourself up for other worse problems then. Uh, so uh, moving right along, that's the uh, compliance center. I, I did want to, while I'm here, I'll just pop into like holds, and this is kind of cool. I don't know if you've seen. Yep. Yeah, so great question. So um, this really only hits exchange um, plan two, so not E1, but uh, plan two, which is in E3 and E4. Uh, but you can add the RMS, uh, you can add the office 
office message encryption a, a la carte. So you can add these capabilities a la carte if you so desire. Um, in, in place hold, uh, th this is kind of neat because you can uh, do holds and things. Uh, you can search all mailboxes or you can search a specific mailbox. So, for example, I know that in my tenant, uh, Betty White is a very nefarious character. Look, she even has two accounts. That's how bad she is, that's Betty White. Um, so I could just search her mailbox if I wanted to, uh, or I can search all mailboxes. And then I can search for um, uh, items, keywords. Uh, it gives you a nice little tip for what you can search for. I can specify, so if I know that this infraction occurred between September and November, um, I can search for those dates and then find these messages. I can select a message type because I know that people who are very smart like me hide things in meetings and then we also hide things in notes. We're not as smart as that uh, that uh, general and his girlfriend who were what? They would just create drafts, right? And they both logged into the same email account and then read the drafts. That's some clever stuff right there. I'm all about that, uh, being clever, that is. Not having a mistress or being in the military. So, um, and this is being recorded, so uh, you got me on tape. All right, uh, what else? I don't know, we were gonna say, oh, this hold thing. Probably the coolest thing about holds, and I don't know, how many of you want have an Office 365 tenant filled with stuff and you've done a hold? Good, everybody again, awesome. So um, what's nice in here, and what I like to show, uh, Athene is a healthcare company in, in uh, Iowa, and uh, what I love about this is uh, I showed them this, that there was a result log. They didn't go any further than here. They were like, how did you do that? And I just specified the mailboxes to hold, the date range, items that I wanted to hold, and then they got this result log. And they're like, we can save millions of dollars just by giving that to our, our legal aid. Just by giving this to our researchers, um, we can save millions just by providing that. They, they didn't care that, oh, you know what you, I, and I was going on my pitch because I'm like every other salesperson in the world, but look, every single PST of every mailbox is also, and they're like, we don't care. You, you know, stop, shut up, this is good, we'll go now, right? So we didn't need to see that all these PSTs were also delivered. But then I got the same question that almost everybody uh, asked is, hmm, and then, oh, the other thing that they loved about this, look at under, under column J, has attachment, uh, something in here should say true. Uh, and uh, so what they, they started, yeah, no, I guess not. Hey, always BitLocker, your machine, um, especially when it's a company policy. Oh, there's one that says true. So what they, what they would do is convert this to a pivot table and then find the attachments and figure out how big they were and looked at who sent this attachment and where it went to. Bam, just that easy. Put them on hold, find it, boom. They love this thing. Um, so kind of a, kind of a cool, uh, cool capability here. Um, I don't know where I was going. I had another story to tell you there, but we'll move on. Uh, is this this session? Yeah. All right, we covered that, covered that, covered that, covered that, covered that, covered that, covered that. Here, need an isolation. All right. So uh, discovery holds, I didn't really do the whole discovery thing. Uh, we'll cir circle back on that. Uh, being able to hold the data. Very interesting. Very interesting. Uh, do, 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 do. Yeah, so uh, Microsoft, we do have this dedicated service and this multi-tenant service. And just know that we don't sell a lot of that dedicated service. It's very costly, there's a bunch of things in there. I think our goal was to sell that to about 100 customers. I think we got as high as like 60 or something. But most of our dedicated customers have moved to multi-tenant. Um, and uh, those, those remaining are, some of them are in the works. Um, so we do do uh, logical separation of the data. And what I always tell customers is like none of this, in about 10 slides, none of this will matter anyway. Um, there are customers out there who go, well, Microsoft, I don't trust you. One of your guys could waltz into the data center and grab my vital email and sell it to my competitors. And, and I always use this 
that it's a little bit like finding your email about a specific thing would be like finding a needle in a needle sack. It's not finding a needle in a haystack because a needle in a haystack would look different than the hay. It would be a needle. But a needle in a needle sack, they all look the same. And then, um, and again, in 10 slides here, I'll show you why. It doesn't really matter. And then above and beyond that, you can do some things like using RMS to protect the data uh, and, and keep it safe. So we do have an ability to send the data strong uh, SSL uh, via transport layer security, and you can force that. I was working with a company in a subsidiary, and they wanted all of the email to be guaranteed PLF between them. Uh, it's easy to do, and uh, you, can, you can do that, right? And we've been able to do that with Poppy, saying we need to have this connection transport layer secured. Data at rest, all of our data now, we're about 80% of the way through SharePoint, but by the time you get home and stuff, we'll probably be at 90% and soon 100% of all data is encrypted at rest. And again, so exchange data has been encrypted at rest since February of 2013. SharePoint data, we just started that project in the spring. Um, it's near 80, 80 couple percent uh, done. Um, all of our servers are BitLocker secured. So again, data is encrypted at rest servers are secured. Um, so somebody, a, uh, nobody just waltzes into a data center except for like when we're on a tour, <laughs> we waltz in. You, have to, you don't have to do that. Um, but we do waltz in when we're on a tour. But like in Chicago, Illinois, that's a 17-acre, 20 football field facility. Do you know how many carbon-based life forms have access to the data center? But they arrive to that data center every day with the exact same privileges I arrive with, which is none. They arrive with zero access privileges to the data in the data center. Um, so when we get an alert that says, oh, in shipper container 56, rack number 7, storage enclosure 4, disk number 2 is about to fail, you've got to go swap that out. The spares are back in the data center. And then that person, so it's called the JIT, just in time, uh, uh, service work order, gets generated. We make sure it's validated. This person is given a task, given a 26-digit machine-generated code that would be impossible to memorize by the average human being, or even above average human being. Since he or she is touching something that may or may not contain data, a manager goes with them. So they're given two minutes and 53 seconds, let's say, uh, it's a one-time access, uh, and it'll expire within, say, let's let's just guess four hours. That's the real answer, but I'm not supposed to tell you that either. I don't think so. That that work order will expire in four hours. Um, they will step up. They will do their biometrics. They will type in their uh, code. Um, they will get weighed. They will walk in. Their manager will come in with them. They will get the spare drive. They will replace that drive. That drive will stay in the data center or an alarm will go up because they'll weigh grams more, so you, you can't go to the bathroom or eat a sandwich back there. Um, then that drive will be uh, quadruply erased by military specs, shredded, and then it's hauled off and burned, melted down. Uh, but again, remember that all the data on there is what? Right. So even if you did get a little piece of that drive and glue it back together and somehow get it off of there, now you have to work to decrypt the data. And that's going to take a long, long time. This is brand new to the data centers. Um, so every file is uniquely encrypted, and that's kind of cool. But also, we've taken this thing, and we're not supposed to say chunking anymore. It's shredding. So just, and we don't actually shred the files, run them through, through a shredder. Um, but we do have a key store, and all the cyber keys, uh, cyber keys are kept in the key store. And then they're attached um, as they are here. Like safe A has key A, safe B, key B, get it? Um, and then we take these files. If it's a large file, my example is always like a 100 meg file. We're going to separate that up into 10 different slices, 10 different shreds. So each component of that file has then its own key. So now if I'm a criminal and I go in and I get that file, now I have to get a key, and it could be one of 10 different keys, making my job much more complex. And nobody in the Baltic or even Brazil is going to be paying somebody to do all these things. And then all of these keys are actually crypto protected as well and reside in a content database. 
So they have to not only break into our data center and get the file, they have to break into the content database, and then they have to break into the key store. And guess what? So this bad guy, the ooh, scary, make him go away, quick, okay. And then over here, huh? We're popping up all over the place. So you'd have to have three attacks coordinated and then figure out which piece of which file has which key on it, right? So uh, what I always say is this is hundreds of thousands of years for somebody to figure this out, and it's just not worth it. They're going to attack you on premise before they're going to do this. Yes? No, Edward Snowden doesn't have access. And as a matter of fact, there's a little bit of a lawsuit going on right now where Microsoft was asked to deliver a customer's data, and we said, you must subpoena the customer. It is their data. And the government said, no, it's in your data center. It's your data you must submit that data to us. And we are paying $250,000 a day to not surrender that data. No other hoster of data has done this in the history of the world. If it was Tom's excellent data center, oh, I would surrender your stuff like that. But Microsoft, 250000 bucks a day we're paying to not surrender that data. Sure. Yeah, yeah, um, you know, so, uh, you know, we've gone above and beyond outside the EU model clause, like, and so you'll see things like Box will say, oh yeah, we're EU model clause, and what they really mean is we're safe harbor, which is step one of the seven parts of EU model clause. We've gone above that and got uh, DPA, data processing uh, ag agreements, with uh, 29 countries around the world. Uh, and again, it's, it's in our privacy, it's in the OST, it's in your contract as a customer that we will not surrender your data. Your data is your data. Yep. Well, we're paying 250 grand a day, every day. Somebody's going to go to jail. It ain't going to be me, but somebody's going. Because again, I'd surrender that stuff like that. So just know that we've got, we've got these attack war game scenarios going on all the time. Um, we have red teams. They're the bad people trying to break in. Uh, we've got the blue teams trying to defend us. There's simulations, all of these things going on. Um, and, and it's really it's really pretty uh, cool the extent that we go to. I mentioned that customers can also use rights management, use rights management templates, or use just rights management, right? So I do have the ability with any, with any file here if I wanted to protect this, right? All I'm going to go is say protect document, restrict access. And here I mentioned that Microsoft, we have a bunch of templates. Ha ha, Tom wasn't lying. Oh, it's not. Hang on one second. How do you like it now? Well, I know my way around a keyboard. Uh, so all I did here is I went to this very PowerPoint that I'm using today, and I went back here and said, protect this file and restrict access, and then I went to our corporate rights. And you can see that, again, in, in the field, when I was out here at corporate and we were working with Harry, and occasionally I wrote a couple of scripts for uh, Steve Ballmer. He used to be a big guy around here or something, I guess. Uh, and um, there, there were many more templates that I could apply there. Like I would say, one was custodians only. So that was like 149 people at Microsoft. Only those 149 people would be able to read um, something that I wrote. And what was cool is I put that on all my documents. So even my boss didn't know what I was doing most of the time. That's a joke. It's not a very good thing. Five, beautiful. That'll be just about perfect. Um, so we got about five minutes uh, remaining here. I'm just going to bounce through. So again, uh, rights protection. Uh, and with the new rights protection, being able to protect and encrypt uh, just about any file in the world, and then being able to do so and have that file um, read uh, on a Android device or an iOS. So another really cool thing where I'm very happy about uh, Satya is uh, it's no longer a Windows first world. I saw a bunch of you know Apple logos here, and as a shareholder of Apple, I'm kind of excited a little bit about that. Uh, and I do know that you probably have a Mac office copy and boot camp and Windows. And a, so you get, we get like twice the profit out of you than any other customer. So <laughs> God, you'll never hear me complain about a uh, Mac in, uh, in an audience. 
Um, Multi-factor auth, and I would normally do this demo here, um, and uh, I heard somebody mention phone factor, and like now we're not suddenly a good partner anymore. I don't, I don't know what that meant, uh, but I didn't like it at all. Uh, so you can still sell phone factor. It's still, it's still phone factor for crying out loud. Um, that's still what's being used here for MFA. The cool thing about this is if you're using, if your customer's using RSA or something else, they can continue to use that. You can still sell MFA. Yep. Yeah, it's called MFA now. It's called multi-factor authentication for Office 365 or multi-factor authentication for Azure. It's two bucks a user a month or a buck a user a month um, if you have Office 365. You still, you still, we still give you a little sniff. Yeah, I am sorry that who's uh, you know I don't know. We let's talk offline. So here's what happens. Sarah Davis goes to log in. Um, she's prompted for a second factor in case she's on an airplane. She could still get a text and log in. I have a lot of lawyers, and in, in Minnesota it's called cabins. In Michigan uh, it's called cottages. Um, but they have weekend cottages or cabins, and they will change their call me at because their cell phones don't work where their cottage or cabin is. So they will say, call my landline, and when they answer the phone, they are instantly signed in. It does say, hey, uh, you wait for the phone, the phone rings, you answer the phone, and then it says, press pound if you haven't instigated this access. So then we know to report it to your people, and then we know to turn off your password. Or it's press pound to go ahead, press one if, if you didn't make this request. And then bam, you're in. And this is how hard this is to set up. You go to users and groups, and up there it says set up multi-factor authentication. You click the setup that's circled in purple, and then you click on the user's name and say enable. Woohoo! So it's sweet, and then you go done. So just like RMS, which to set up RMS on premises, I wrote the book on that, how to deploy RMS back in 1999, 327 steps. It's six clicks to enable RMS in Office 365. App password, um, if people are using uh, not multi-factor but only factor authentication, like I know the US Air Force, uh, they make people, I don't have my badge with me, I thought I did, uh, they make people insert their badge. And I asked the general, um, well, why do you do that? And they said, because we lock their badges in a safe every night. And I'm like, well, why do you do that? And he said, because these are the people who are responsible for the nuclear codes and dialing up a yield of a nuclear bomb. So yeah, I didn't know that you could make a bomb like five megatons and take out a city, or 50 megatons and take out a state. I, 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 I didn't know that. So uh, kind of cool stuff. But then Link, when you launch Link, it doesn't say insert your smart card, right? So what we did is we created this app password thing that says, OK, who are you creating this for? Link, copy this password, paste it in, bam, we're in the link. Kind of cool. App password for WS Trust rich application, which is cool. And then I'll, I'll close with this. And again, you can use SMIND. You can still use somebody else's encryption. You can still use PGP if you wanted to. Um, I talked about the detect, act, and classify. Uh, and this is coming to SharePoint as well. We're just at the detect uh, part of that stage today. And then um, everybody should know this, the Cloud Security Alliance. Go to the Cloud Security Alliance uh, webpage. We were the first uh, STAR member even though six people from Google were on their board and five or six from Cisco and a few from IBM. Uh, it's a great resource for you to use with your customers. And what I like about that is we have a document that says here are the CSA controls and what each of the CSA controls means and how we satisfy or exceed the satisfaction for that. There are a bunch of standard certifications like ISO 27001, SSAE and SOC type 1 and 2 that we comply with. Um, and just know that you know, where most people, the average data center in the USA has like 56 controls on it. When we submitted to our ISO 27001, we submitted 996 controls. That's now up to 1,012. So 20 times what the average customer has in their data center. 20 times for ISO 27001. Um, our, I, I've heard stories. I can neither confirm nor deny this. Uh, but like Google, when they passed their ISO 27001, they submitted something like 50, 50 controls. Their ISO team was like three or four people, and they were there for three or four days, and then went home for three or four days, and uh, were done. Ours, uh, it was a busload, like 30 people came, and they were on site with us for five weeks and then away for a couple of weeks. So significantly better uh, hurdle. 
But do head out to trustoffice365.com and uh, go to that trust center and you'll find the um, online security white paper there and a bunch of other uh, great content to help you tell this story as well as these slides with a couple of them missing. Uh, I know we're uh, at time, so I wanted to thank you very much for your time and attention today and hope to see you in uh, some of the other sessions. Um, please fill out your evaluations and hand them at the uh, back of the room. Appreciate it very much.